My name is Chris Morris. I'm uh, from the Asian Development Bank. I'm head of the NGO and Civil Society Center. Um, and we have uh, with me uh, today um, Ms. Anu uh, Gurung from Nepal. Namaste. Um, I have been practicing my sign language. And my Great. name is Chris. Chris. <laughs> and I have a special sign name, which is Chris. And who also has a, a name? My, my name is Anju. That's my sign name, Anju. Anju. Anju Gurung. So welcome to the Asian Development Bank and to the Philipp Philippines, to the Asian Youth Forum. Thank you very much. Um, Firstly, I'd like to congratulate you on your uh, uh, presentation this morning at the People's Session. Um, it certainly raised uh, a lot of important questions, um, particularly amongst um, the marginalized uh, communities that are so important in Asia and the Pacific. Um, first, I'd like to, um, for our audience, share a little bit about your story, uh, Anju. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm very glad that I get this opportunity to, to speak this morning and again here and with you. Uh, about uh, me, I was born not deaf. I was hearing when I was born. So when I was uh, three years old, I lost my hearing. And I started going to school at the age, age of eight. I was quite late going to school because my uh, father and my mom, they don't know about deaf school and they went to doctor first and they tried to fix my hearing and they want me to be hearing. Uh, but then after when they figured out that I can't hear anymore. So then they look for a school and then I went to school. So I think it, the crucial time I lost because that was the period I should have a long language. I couldn't get language up to uh, age of eight. So after finishing the school from the deaf school in Kathmandu and I went to India because there is no uh, f uh, formal education after grade 12 in Nepal. So I have to go to India and learn about sign language and more detailed uh, uh, study I have done in sign language. I have done my bachelor in sign linguistic in uh, from India. Now uh, I'm kind of, uh, I also worked for Medistop uh, for a data uh, collection project for the reproductive health system of disabled people in Nepal. Uh, so it was more focused on a disability group and the reproductive health, how the, how the reproductive health system is uh, accessible for deaf and other kind of person with disability or not. Could we hand over the report then after. Could we explore a little bit about the number of um, other um, deaf people there are in, in Nepal in a similar situation? Uh, about the census, uh, with deaf federation in Nepal, uh, they, they think that it should be 300,000 to 400,000 deaf people in Nepal, but the uh, data is not that clear yet. So the statistics about the number of deaf Deaf people is is, is uh, not particularly good, but I understand yes. there are of the three or four hundred thousand deaf people, there's something like twenty twenty five thousand who have skills like you can communicate using yes, sign yes, language. True. How important is that to you? Uh, I think, uh, for example, like a hearing child when born and then learn, start learning from uh, father or mother or people in the family talking. So get language from there. And for deaf people, it should be all visual. So I can't hear, so I have to rely on my eyes to see the things and get the knowledge about the things. And without that, it's very difficult for me. So that sign language is very important. So you said you first went to school when you were eight. Um, yes. That was a special school to learn sign language? Yes. And how many similar schools are there in Nepal? We have a 19 deaf school in Nepal, all over Nepal. 
in uh, 75 district we have in 19 district so what sort of percent of deaf people actually go to these specialized schools so mostly so if you look at nepal the map so in kathmandu we have a deaf school and uh, the people nearby kathmandu area uh, if they have a uh, deaf children it's very easy for them to send to them and they can go to school it's same with some other uh, areas as well i i know from your presentation earlier you mentioned the difference between being differentially able and being uh, disabled can you explain a little bit of the difference for you personally? Uh, so differently able, it's like kind of, a, that's differentiating actually. So I'm, I, I'm a disabled because I, I can't hear. That doesn't mean that I, I hear from my eyes or from my other organ. I don't have a different uh, speciality actually. I don't have a different ability. That's not my different ability. I do have my problem. I, I can't hear. That's the reality. That's right. my identity. That's why we like to call ourselves person with uh, disability. And the United Convention on Right of Person with Disability has also clearly mentioned that it should be called person with disability. So you have a disability because you are deaf. Yes, that's my identity. Yes, I accept that. As such, do you feel marginalized in communities, in your family? Um, what is the, the result of your disability? Yeah. So in community, uh, especially uh, kind of like programs when they have, I was not invited or I was not part of that program. Uh, in family as well, uh, if they have something uh, planned program, like some program they are going to do, and I was not involved in that, in planning, for, and also sometimes going with the people. I don't know communication with them, and so I just feel very bored going in community, in group. So as uh, with your disability, that uh, creates a situation where you're marginalized. Um, does society on a whole, um, in terms of programs from government, uh, facilities, um, also um, affects you as a as a marginalized person? Uh, yeah, I think so there are some uh, barriers created by the community uh, So sometimes they think that I can't do anything and they think that uh, I'm dumb. I Can't uh, understand anything. I can make a decision and in and talking about government. I think uh, uh, They don't have that kind of mechanism to look disability and make a kind of uh, planning for development of disabled people in Nepal. Well, clearly with your Bachelor of Arts from India uh, um, and, and your uh, ability to speak and move such an audience this, this morning, um, uh, you would have certainly convinced our audience that uh, you shouldn't be considered a marginalized uh, person or, or with the disability, it doesn't affect your, your uh, ability to contribute. How do you, um, how do you think um, um, youth, uh, the, the rest of the participants we have at the, the conference um, this week um, can work with you to help support the several hundred thousand other deaf people in, in, in Nepal? I think the most important thing is inclusion. So I came here in Philippines and I feel very uh, good talking with the people there. And I feel kind of a, a friendly environment we are having with the participants. And, and many uh, participants also wanted to work with me. Like sometimes I don't have interviewers. When there's a break or tea break, sometimes I have to communicate. And we, we just write with with each other for communication. I think that's the, some, something coordination they can do with other deaf people as well. Yes, cer certainly communication is, is something that I've learned in my life you can do even if you don't speak the same, same language or you don't hear each other. Yeah, I think um, language is very important. Those, those skills. So you, you, you mentioned in inclusion. 
Um, you've spent the last four or five days out working with the youth in the local communities. Can you share a little bit about your, your uh, experience? So I think it was a very amazing experience for me for a lifetime. And I was kind of included in that group and I always feel that I was part of a group. I never felt that I was alone. So that was one of the biggest uh, uh, experience I had. And I, I was able to share my experience with them uh, when going for the research as well, in a group discussion as well. And I was part of the group all the time. So uh, we went to the Gawad Kalina and spent a night with uh, the people in the community. And I was in a house where there was children as well. And I was trying to communicate with them in kind of natural sign language. And that was very good communication we established. Okay, we'll come back to sign language and the importance of, of that then. Um, and you mentioned ed ed education. Um, your Bachelor of Arts is specializing in, in uh, sign language. Um, I understand um, that there are 10 to 15,000 words commonly spoken in language, but in the Nepalese sign language, there are only 5,000 words. Um, can you say something about your, your work to help um, increase the, the uh, breadth of sign language in Nepal? And, and also the number of people that uh, have the skill. So uh, previously only deaf people are gathered and they make the sign language. But I think that only deaf people cannot develop the sign language in a whole. We need to export, these, uh, export persons and also linguists to develop the language. And I think we are doing that these days. So because uh, making new signs is not like uh, someone make a sign and then that started all, all the people doing the same. I think this, we have a kind of methodology developing a sign language and we need to consult with many deaf people, many deaf associations, deaf schools. The, uh, more to, uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, we need to think about the education because only deaf people can get education through sign language. If there is no sign language, deaf people cannot get the education. And 5,000 words certainly is not enough for them to give all the, uh, all the learnings they need to have. Okay, so we need, we need to have a more uh, um, diverse language, a, more, a, a wider language. Um, but uh, also, also, I'm getting the message that it, it's extremely important. The, the number of facilities, the number of schools, the number of instructors, to deal with the the uh, several hundred thousand deaf people in in, in Nepal is is an essential area that that need, needs addressing, um, and and looking at uh, and you people like yourself, that's a tremendous asset the government is is not using by by um, including you into the society and using your your uh, um, your capabilities to uh, to help the country. Yeah, I think. I'd uh, um, just like to, to say a little bit more about education and the importance of, of, of it. Um, um, and sign language is uh, um, itself. We're here at the uh, Asia Youth Forum um, of the Asian Development Bank in uh, the Philippines. Um, the theme of the uh, forum is the uh, SDGs and inclusion and of youth into the SDGs. Um, from your side, how do you, you think um, or how can you express the contribution in your eyes that, that young people can uh, uh, contribute to the SDGs? So regarding SDG. So. I think so it's very important that uh, people should get the learning about STG and what their rules first so that they can start thinking about how we can start doing work for STG achievement. So I think uh, it's very important and we, I had got that ex uh, knowledge about STG and I think that's very important one for our development as well. So I think uh, uh, whatever I learn I, if I could spread, uh, give this information to deaf youth in Nepal, that would, would be my contribution. Okay, so we're going to summarize um, 
some of our, our, our discussions, if, if, if I can, but I'd like you to, to help out on, on this. Um, SDGs, I understand the, there's no United Nations or general word for it in sign language. No. We, so we do S, D, and D. So we do S. <laughs> we S, practice D. this, and I'm not very good at, at the D. Yes. And then G. G. Yes. Right? So if you could do that, and I'll show you my sign language to contribute to the message um, of youth throughout Asia Pacific. So can you just repeat the question? Yes. Sorry. So we, if you do S. 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 D. D. G. G. Okay. If you could do it again, and then I will do S, my sign for it as D, well. D. C. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for taking uh, time with us uh, today, um, uh, and, and you. Um, SDG number four, education, seems to be your priority. Yes. Um, I know you also feel that SDG number eight, in terms of decent work and contribution of deaf and marginalized people, is, is something you're, you're passionate about. And the, particularly the inclusion of sure. young, young people and marginalized people into families, communities, and to contribute to society is something that's close to your heart. And I think uh, STG, after STG 8, so STG 10 is also very important. It's all about inequalities because uh, persons with disability in their life, they feel uh, not equal and they are uh, having this kind of feeling and they are not treated in that way. So I think that's also right. very for, important. For inclusion, of course, uh, um, equity in you know, SDG number, number 10. Thank you for reminding me of that. So thank you for, for joining us this afternoon at the Asian Development Bank. I'd also like to, to thank uh, Samu uh, uh, for his support uh, and contribution to, to, the, uh, to the conference uh, and to accompanying uh, and you, I wish you uh, um, a fruitful um, further two days at the Asia Pacific uh, uh, Youth Forum. Uh, um, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. So uh, I was ab able to explain about my work, about my learnings, my experiences, sharing. So I'm very, very glad and thank you very much. So I'm very happy. Okay, thank you very much.